if you listen to the questions that people ask you, you realize what they're really doing is telling you what they think your value is to them. So if you can figure that out, then you can be increasingly more valuable to people because what better thing is there in the world than understanding what people want and expect from you so that you can deliver upon it. Welcome, everybody, to The Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Chris Harder Show, where we absolutely believe that both prosperity and generosity can and must coexist. Today is a treat because I'm sitting down with the legendary Jason Pfeiffer, who is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. Like, take a minute and say, whoa, the head honcho, the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. Can you imagine the business acumen and the knowledge and the vision that you gain over time when you are the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine? Well, we're gonna sit down with Jason and we are absolutely going to have a great conversation, not only about the common threads that make entrepreneurs successful, but more about change. You see, he's got a brand new book out called Build for Tomorrow. And he's got a really popular podcast also called Build for Tomorrow. And the book and the podcast study change makers in history and they find the common threads so that you can feel comfortable with change. I know the economy's changing. I know the world's changing. But the thing is, Everything's always changing and the fear that we have around it and the discomfort that we have around it and the hesitation that we have when it comes to change doesn't have to be. We can actually learn to love change, to embrace change, to lean into change. And best of all, something that he and I do very well in common to automatically see the opportunity in change. So listen, I'm going to be real with you. If you're afraid of the changes in the economy coming up, if you're afraid of some of the changes in the world coming up, if you're afraid about some of the changes in business, or if you just fear change in general, then I want you to really listen up to this entire episode. And at the end, like we always do, we're going to throw a few free books at some of you as well. So stick with us to the end, because I promise you this, by the end of this episode, you will feel comfortable when you are presented with change. You will no longer fear change. Because as we sit down with Jason... I will tell you one thing. He is the master at making sure that when it comes to change in business, you're going to be okay. Also, do not forget, this is your last chance to apply for the Elite Mastermind. I've got a really unique circle of friends. Jason is one of my new friends in this circle of friends. And I've got the unique ability to get the best of the best out of my circle of friends to come and teach at our mastermind. Now we are down to the last couple of spots and we have officially extended more offers than there are spots. So this means this is literally your last chance. This is your last call to get your application and if you want to be considered. Because if we do a Zoom interview quick, if I extend you an offer for the mastermind quick, and if you grab it quick, you can grab it out from somebody else who's hesitating or considering their spot. This is your last chance to get in for the 2023 Elite Mastermind. Go to chrisharder.me forward slash mastermind. Check it out. Fill out the app. We'll get on Zoom right away. I'm telling you, don't hesitate. Last call. Go to chrisharder.me forward slash mastermind. Again, it's chrisharder.me forward slash mastermind. Fill out the application. And if the application looks like a one that'll qualify, we'll jump on Zoom and see if you get one of those last couple spots. All right, guys. If you fear change, listen up. Because my new friend, Jason Pfeiffer, is going to make sure that you are bulletproof going into any change coming your way. 
Here we go. Jason, well, listen, it's great to meet you and it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks. This is where I always talk about proximity and just loving on your network. Mike Zeller connected us. So glad mm-hmm. that he did. This yeah. is an interview I'm really excited to do because you're doing really awesome things out there. And uh, my audience is, is going to be better than before we found them, or I should say we're going to leave them better than before we found them by the end of this thing. So I appreciate your time. I love that. Thanks. And, you know, to pull the curtain back a little bit more also, <laughs> you know, one of the benefits of the pandemic, I think, is that everyone's lives became crazy and then everyone felt more forgiving of everyone else's lives when they were crazy. So I had to reschedule this like two or three times because I got two kids, things shipped around, a kid gets sick, you know, it was like my whole schedule. And so you guys were just so cool about always rolling with it. And I really appreciate that. You know what? Well, one, thank you. But two, we are family first. Like yeah. as you and I get to know each other, you're going to realize it is a family first culture that we build everything around. So birthday parties, special occasions, those type of things. I had such a high respect for you. And maybe this is a great lesson for everyone listening. You know, because mm-hmm. everyone's so worried to reschedule. They're so worried to, to do something wrong. I had such a high degree of respect for you when you said, hey, got a birthday. It was a birthday, if I remember correctly. Got a birthday the, coming up. Was yeah. it your son's? That sounds, I can't remember exactly what it was. <laughs> I, 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 I should look back. God, I anyway, got a family yeah. event coming up and, and uh, family takes precedence. Can we reschedule yeah. this thing? And yeah, it was in that moment. I'm like, oh, I love this dude. Oh, I appreciate that. That's really awesome. And and I and I have learned over the years to just be really upfront about that kind of stuff and apologize, but be clear on like why I'm moving it. And people are generally really forgiving. And if they're not, then you know, it's probably not somebody who you want to do a lot of work with anyway. Yeah, if they're not, that's oh, a, it's oh a, I remember. It's a great yeah, sign. I just looked it up by the way. Just 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 for just for the sake of it, it was that my my wife had to be out of town and that and therefore I was juggling the kids. And there was no way that I was going to be able to talk to you and do that at the same time. So that was, yeah. <laughs> hey, by the way, I think that's the other thing that the pandemic did. It made any background noise, any background, anything way more forgiving. Like the whole stuffiness of podcasting has gone right out the window. And I love oh it. Oh my God. You know, and yes, absolutely. I have let my kids, if my kids burst into a room now and I'm doing something live, even if like people are paying me a bunch of money to do, to like give them a keynote or something. I used to try to usher the kids out of the room. Now you just put them on your lap. And what you find is that people consider that to be the most genuine and memorable part of the whole thing. Yes. And it's because that's the part that they see themselves in the most and they connect with the most. I'll tell you a story that's sort of different, but also related to this that really stuck with me. And this is the theme here is the thing that you think is bad turns out to be good is... I was, about a year ago, I was interviewing Jimmy Fallon for Entrepreneur Magazine. And Jimmy is lovely. Like everything you expect of Jimmy is basically what he really is. I went and I I spent a bunch of time with him at 30 Rock and I really liked him. And at the very end, he said, he was like, you know, we were shaking hands and I was about to leave. And he said, hey, look, if you are writing the story and you just realize like, "Ah, I I wish I asked Jimmy this question. He's like, just reach out. I'm happy to do a follow-up. And I said, Jimmy, I really appreciate that. I'm not going to do that because you've given me so much of your time and I want to respect that. And I left. And then a week later, I was writing the story. And wouldn't you know it, there was this moment where I was like, oh, if only I had asked Jimmy this thing, the story would be so much better. And I'd say, well, he did invite me. So I reached out to his publicist. His publicist put me in touch with Jimmy. It took about a week because he's a busy guy. But when he got on the phone, he said, I said, hey, I, you know, I really appreciate you making the time to do this. And he's like, he's like, are you kidding? I make that offer to follow up if you need it to so many people. And you're the only person to ever take me up on it. And I said, you know, it's funny, Jimmy, because I was afraid to, because you had given me a lot of your time and I don't want to abuse that. I want to be respectful of the agreement that we had made. And so I, I like felt bad that I'm taking more of your time. And he says, no, he says, no, because you reaching out right now shows me that you want to be extremely thorough and thoughtful. And that is the kind of person that I want to talk to, is someone who I know wants to get things really right. And that's why I'm excited to talk to you. And that was a big eye-opener for me because I had been afraid of doing that kind of thing, of reaching back out and asking for more time. I mean, look, I know it's like I'm the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, but I'm dealing with people who are very, very busy. And I want to be respectful of that. But to realize that 
actually sometimes the thing that I think is a burden is actually a sign of engagement and success. Once you realize that is the case in one thing, you realize it's the case all over the place. I love that story. It's so empowering because people need to be reminded to ask for what you need, especially if it is in the integrity of doing your best job possible, putting your best foot forward possible. And look, he ended up loving and respecting you for that. And you guys probably have a more memorable relationship now had it been that over just a quick passing interview like he does a million times a day. That's totally true. In fact, I have found that the interviews that I've done with people who, you know, it's hard to build a real relationship with them. They're very busy. They meet a lot of people. The ones that have gone beyond just me needing them for some short amount of time are, they're always the ones in which some weird thing happened. Some kind of, there was a mistake, there was a problem. And in solving it or resolving it, it made the whole experience more memorable. I remember interviewing Chip Gaines of Chip and Joanna Gaines, uh, you know, Fixer Upper. And Chip was, a he was 11 minutes late. <laughs> and I have, you know, for anybody who is not used to interviewing celebrities, 11 minutes late is early. I mm-hmm. mean, like celebrities are really late. Right? I mean, you get people who are hours, days late. Chris, uh, he was 11 minutes late. And so, but when he, when he shows up, he gives me this speech, this genuine heartfelt speech about how everybody's time is incredibly valuable. And he is, he tries to honor that as much as he can. And he's so sorry that he wasted my time. And I was like, Chip, 11 minutes late is early. I was fine. I did not a problem. Right. And, but then we ended up talking about that and about how, like honoring people's time and the recognition that even as we get busier and quote unquote, more important that like, that shouldn't mean that other people's time is valued less. And, and that conversation ultimately led us to, to like a, a greater relationship that we still have today. So I, I, it's like without that moment, we wouldn't have connected as much. So I love those things where it's, it's the unexpected, it's something a little bit wrong, and then you can make it even more right. What a class act. What a class yeah. act that he is. And what a great lesson and reminder. Give people grace. Man, we are yes. all doing the best we can in this world. Mm-hmm. Give some people some grace. So you mentioned that you're the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, and that is like the big, sexy, shiny headline. But yeah. I actually want to start somewhere else. Of course, we're going to touch on that, but I want to start somewhere else with the show today. Somebody referred to you or at, referred you to me and called you a student of change. And I thought mm. that is so good. A student of change. You don't hear somebody referred to as a student of change often. Yeah. So unpack that for me a little bit. What makes you sure. a student of change? So years and years ago, when I first became editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, people started asking me this question all the time. And the question was, what are the qualities of successful people? Mm. And it was weird that I was getting this uncoordinated attack. Like everyone was asking me the same question from totally different, right? Like I go on podcasts, I speak at events. And I was trying to understand why they were asking me that. And I came to this insight, which is that if you listen to the questions that people ask you, you realize what they're really doing is telling you what they think your value is to them. So if you can figure that out, then you can be increasingly more valuable to people. Because what better thing is there in the world than understanding what people want and expect from you so that you can deliver upon it? And so I was thinking, well, what what is driving this question? And I realized the answer is that people see me as a pattern matcher. I'm the guy who gets to talk to lots of people. And therefore, I should see patterns across all of those experiences. And so people are wondering what drives success. And I wondered, what's the answer to that question? I need a good answer. And I spent years years talking to people about it, thinking about it, writing, just trying to figure out like, what is that singular thing that I think is is infused in everybody who I find, all the entrepreneurs who are just incredibly successful. And then the answer that I came to is adaptability, that the most successful people are the most adaptable because they are the ones who try something, it does not work. They treat that failure as data and they build it into what they do next. And that that is just the way in which they operate. The question then became, well, how do they do that? Because it's not something people are born with. It's something that people can learn. And that is the reason why, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad Mike called me a student of change. I, I, I love that because that's really what I've spent years doing is trying to understand what it is that people are doing to prepare themselves for moments of major disruption, but also to navigate it. And I think that over the course of many, many years in interviewing thousands of people that I've, I've, I've figured out a few of those patterns. 
Jason, you said something in there. I want to make sure people caught because it was so empowering. You said adaptability isn't something we're born with. It's something we can learn, right? So all of a sudden, now everyone realizes, okay, I can change. I can adapt. Like Mm -hmm. these things don't have to scare me. Could you give me one or two examples of adaptability being something that either you or somebody else learned and what they did with it? Sure. So I have come to realize that we make this mistake. And the mistake that we make is that we identify too closely with the output of our work. Mm -hmm. Just to say that our identity becomes tied to the thing that we make or the role that we occupy. And that, you know, that's very natural. I, I, I do it. I'm sure you do it. But the problem is that those things are very easily changeable. And so the moment in which what you do or what you make changes, if your identity is tied to that, then it's not just a change to how you work. It is a change to who you are. And that feels very disruptive. It also then kind of feels like it shuts down all the different avenues that you could go to because you're now like, well, well, I've just lost who I am or what I do. I don't, I don't know that I'm good at anything else. And that I think then leads people to try to maintain what is leaving them rather than figure out how to gain something new. So what's a, what's a different way to do this? Well, I have found that as I talk to entrepreneurs, they often, and not just entrepreneurs, but great leaders and thinkers that they, they have a way of articulating the thing about them that does not change in times of change. It often is articulated in a really simple way. I'll give you an example. I remember talking to the CEO of Foodsters, which is a, it's a company, they make baking mixes and ready to eat baked goods and stuff. You can find that at Whole Foods. And they were going through a major change and was altering the products that they were producing. And I was asking Greg, their CEO, if this is, I was like, I was like, is this a bummer? Like, you know, like emotionally, how are you doing? Because your company is going through this change that you didn't quite anticipate or want. And he says, you know, it's not a bummer because what it comes down to is why are we in business? We're in business to bring joy to people through upgraded sweet baked goods. That's what it's all about. And it's, you know, he casually tossed that off. But when he said it, I realized what he has done here is he has found a way to create a mission that is separate from the day-to-day products that he serves. Because you know what? If he sells baking goods, or if he sells baking mixes, and then the world stops wanting baking mixes, if he thinks of himself as a baking mix company, well, then he is, there's nothing else to do. He's dead in the water. But if he thinks of himself as bringing joy to people through upgraded sweet baked goods, well, there are a million ways to do that. And I have found that for me, my version of that is I tell stories in my own voice. That's my sentence. Why not? I tell magazine stories because I mean, check this out. You know, people can't, Chris, you can see it. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are listening can't, but I'm holding up my phone right now, holding up my phone. And um, my boss has my phone number. His name is Bill. He's the president of Entrepreneur Media. He could call this number at any time and he could fire me. He could. All he has to do is call me. And so if my identity is I'm a magazine editor, then I am one phone call away from losing my identity. That is a dangerous place to be. We need to spend time thinking about what and who we are. Pick a sentence where every word is not easily subject to change. I tell stories, not magazine stories, not newspaper stories, not podcasts, not books. In my own voice, that's me setting the terms for how I want to operate. The more in which we can understand who we are and what we do at a base level so that we could articulate it in a way in which we are not anchored to the things that are most changeable in our lives, that is the first step to becoming more adaptable. That is awesome. That's an exercise that everybody should hit pause, rewind two minutes, listen to that, and then build your mission statement yeah. exactly the way that you just described it so that they don't sit around afraid that that one piece of identity could go away at any moment. But instead, yeah. the overarching mission of who they are and what they do, there's always going to be a way to accomplish that. And that takes away a lot of that anxiety of change. That's right. And you know, it's funny, I I have a little exercise to do that. I'll, I'll tell you very, sort of very briefly, which is, Imagine someone comes up to you at a party and asks what you do. 
And the very first thing that you're going to talk about, of course, is you're going to talk about your tasks. So you would you would say, oh, what I do is I do this every day or this is the role I occupy, right? Like whatever it is that you think of, I would have said, I, I started my career in, a news, in the newspaper industry. I was a newspaper reporter. So I would have said, oh, I go out and I, I'm a newspaper reporter. I go out and I report the news. I put it in the paper. So now we're going to do it a second time. Someone comes up to you at a party and asks what you do. Anything that you thought about the first time is off the table now. Can't say it. So cannot talk about your tasks, cannot talk about whatever you had originally identified as. Now, what do you talk about? I think the answer is you talk about your skills, what you're good at. I would have said, well, what do I do? I go out and I'm really good at gathering information, processing that information and making it useful to others. Also, a nice way to think about ourselves, but still kind of surface level. So we're going to do it one more time. Someone comes up to you at a party and asks what you do. Now, you can't talk about your tasks and you cannot talk about your skills. What do you talk about? I think here now we're at our core, right? We're at something that we must be able to articulate in that single, very carefully selected sentence. And that is the thing that I think is going to carry you forward because it enables you. I travel the country talking to executive teams often, but also like larger teams as well. People bring me in. I mean, I was just, I just did this at Google a week ago and I walk everyone through this exercise. And afterwards, people come up to me. I, you know, I talk for an hour. But I, this exercise is always the thing that lodges in people's brains. And then they come up to me afterwards and they all want to tell me their sentence. You know, I help build great things. I solve complex problems. I help others achieve greatness. Like whatever, they come up with these very simple things and they're so excited about it. And I think that that goes to show you how infrequently people think about this for themselves. They're not reflecting upon the reason why they're doing a thing that they're doing. They are so focused on the doing of it. And we need to make sure that we understand what ground we're actually standing on. I can understand why they're probably so excited to come up and share their one sentence, because as you're describing these things and and taking me layer by layer through the exercise and removing what my answer can be, shooting from the hip, I was like, oh God, what would my answer be? And (laughs) it hit me. I leave entrepreneurs better than I found them, right? So the modalities in which I do that or the ways in which they're better, those things can all change. Mm -hmm. But if it if the core mission is leaving entrepreneurs better than I found them, and by the way, I've never thought about this before. I've always thought I want to leave people better than I found them, but I've never let that sentence come out of my, my mouth before. That is what your exercise does. It gives clarity to here's your mission. There's many different ways to do it. Have no fear. There will always be a way for you to accomplish it. That's right. I love that, right? And now like just to put a button on it, like contrast that, I leave entrepreneurs better than I found them with the statement, I make a great podcast for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right. Like that, that second one, true as it, true as it could be. What happens if people stop listening to podcasts? Yeah. Then you got nothing, right? Yeah. Then you are, a, then you are valueless. But I, I leave, I leave entrepreneurs better than I found them is infinitely expandable. There are always new ways to do that. God, I love that so much value. I either read somewhere or somebody told me that you are really optimistic. Like you see, opportunity and everything. And that's something you and I have in common. Yeah. And it's funny on the subject of change, because I think they're very much connected. Years ago, I'm talking probably 14, 15 years ago when I worked at HSBC, I had a corporate, you know, buttoned up corporate life before I got into mm-hmm. this entrepreneurial world. They would bring in speakers and teachers to talk to their executive teams and, and at these events. And there was a guy named Matthew Kelly, who's an author of many different books. You've ever come across him before? I haven't. So he used to teach a lot on change. This is about 15 years ago. And he had said something that stuck with me forever from that stage. He said, most people think that they don't like change. And the truth is they they typically end up always loving the change. What they're uncomfortable with is transition. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to separate those two things in my mind, all of a sudden, any fear of change kind of went out the window And I became very optimistic about this idea of change and that there's going to be an opportunity in every single change. And I think you kind of tick that way a little bit too. Talk to me about finding opportunity and change. Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it, that people are concerned about the transition. You know, there are a couple of things that it makes me think of that I found. Number one is that as I look at how people process new things, what I find is that, you know, people don't like new things, but you know what they really do like? They like better versions of old things. And there's nothing wrong with that because ultimately great innovation and even great changes in life are are about creating better versions of old things. 
And the problem is often that we don't see the connection between the new and the old because we're focused too much on surface level, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're focused too much on maybe the way in which something is experienced every day rather than with the role that it fulfills in our lives. My wife and I just experienced this recently because we moved from a neighborhood that we love that we lived in for years in Brooklyn called Park Slope, which is very hot and trendy and therefore also incredibly expensive. And we live in this tiny little two-bedroom apartment and we have two boys. So we were really on top of each other. And then we found a, a much, much larger space, but deeper into Brooklyn. It's not, it's in a different neighborhood called Kensington. It's not very trendy. There aren't that many cool restaurants. And as we were moving, you know, we had a lot of anxieties over well, what are we losing? What are we missing? What are we leaving behind? And it was hard not to see everything through the lens of what we were losing rather than the things that we were going to gain. So everything became about, oh, but it's going to be much harder to get the kids to this place or, oh, now we're not going to uh, have, you know, X place right around the corner from us. And then once we got here, what we discovered was that actually there were so many improvements in our life there were improvements in the amount of, like the space led to lower anxiety and led to the kids feeling like they had more control over their lives and because they had their own rooms now. And, and anyway, what, I, what I've come to think about this is like, we would have done ourselves a great service by not equating change with loss, because I think that's what we often do, but rather by trying to focus on gain. Because we're naturally programmed to fear loss. You know, there's this psychological um, theory, the uh, loss aversion theory, which basically shows that, and it's been validated over decades, that we focus more on avoiding loss than we do on what we can gain. That's just a human quality. And as a result, when change happens, we are going to think about what we're losing rather than trying to hypothesize and then maximize the thing that we're going to gain. Imagine if we just answered or asked a couple questions of everything that we did. Like, number one, what, what's the new thing? Let's just state it. Number two, what new habit or skill are we going to learn as a result? Mm -hmm. And then number three, how can that be put to good use? And if we just focus on that, we start to hypothesize the gain that we're going to get. And, and then once we make that transition, what we will ultimately discover is that we can move faster because we are focusing on the gain towards it and towards making it a part of our lives. And then you know what? The loss, it just doesn't feel nearly as substantial as it once did. You know, this is probably the perfect time to kind of bring up your new book, Build mm. for Tomorrow an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast and, and future-proofing your career. Yeah. It is so amazingly timely for not just the big change that we came out of with COVID, mm -hmm. but more so in my eyes, the change in economic factors coming up over this yeah. next year, however long it is. So in that book, you talk about these four different phases of mm -hmm. change. Would you mind touching on each one of those? Because I think it's really important. Awareness is such a superpower, such a great tool for people to have. I think it's important for people to understand these four phases and recognize where they might be at with fearing some of the upcoming changes in the economy. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, the, the four phases, so what I found is that everyone goes through change in the same four phases. And they are panic, adaptation, new normal, wouldn't go back. Let's break those down. So panic, obviously, you know what panic is. Everyone feels it. And I, and I really think that a lot of the panic is driven by a focus on loss and then an extrapolation of that loss, which is to say that we see change coming. We think about the things we're going to lose. And then because we don't know what else is going to happen, we just start to extrapolate the loss. Well, because I lost this, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. And then because I'm not going to be able to do this, I won't have this other thing. And then that starts to feel truly panic inducing. And then we get to adaptation where we start to, because we finally get to that point or rather, or sometimes just because we don't have any other ounce of, of, of strength left to panic is that we start to look around and we say, what do I have available? Mm -hmm. What can I start to use? What new ideas do I have? What new opportunities do I have? Then we get to new normal, 
where we start to have a new foundation, a new level of comfort or familiarity, something that we can build from. And then finally, we reach wouldn't go back. And when we say, I have something so new and valuable that I wouldn't want to go back to a time before I had it. That's what really you're describing there a moment ago, where we're talking about the transition is the hardest part. But once we get to the other side, it brings us great value. We often forget as soon as we reach wouldn't go back how hard it was to get there. And the great challenge there is that, you know, if we go through this whole process and we reach wouldn't go back and then we we forget how much pain was involved in getting to wouldn't go back, then we haven't really created for ourselves a roadmap to do it the next time. Because there will be a next time, guaranteed. I see it with my... My son is seven years old and you know what he hates? New shoes. He <laughs> hates them, he hates new shoes. And so that means that every single time that he outgrows his shoes, we get him these new shoes and he refuses to wear them. And it's a whole big battle every time. And every year, I've been doing this for years, every year I try to explain to him, you know, Fen, Fen's his name, the shoes, the old shoes that you want to hold on to right now were once new shoes that you hated. Wow. Uh, you used to hate these shoes and then they became familiar and now they're the old shoes. And so these next shoes, you're going to come to love them too. And he can't wrap his head around that. And that's understandable because he's seven. But you know what? As adults, we need to do a better job of wrapping our heads around that because the thing is that we're in constant cycles. The new becomes the old becomes the new. We can't spend too much energy debating whether something should happen when it has happened. It just, it just, it doesn't serve us to spend a lot of energy trying to retain the thing that is gone. We have to deal with what we have in front of us and try to find ways to create value out of that. You know, the story you told about Fen, your son, you know, holding yeah. on to the old shoes and forgetting mm -hmm. that they were once new shoes that he didn't want. That's a great metaphor for all of us to, to remember, put in our back pockets mm -hmm. and realize that that last stage of change that you're talking about, the new normal that we would never give away, that we would never go back to, right? If we can just remember that story about Fen's shoes that, hey, I know it feels new, it feels scary right now, but there's going to be a time that we don't want to give these shoes up then yeah. that can help us fast forward to the future, fast forward to that that fourth stage mm -hmm. where we would never want to go back and mm -hmm. maybe get us or frame us a little bit more optimistically about whatever changes in front of us. Yeah, you know, it's a good question to ask. Well, let me tell you the bad question. Here's the question that we 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 all find ourselves asking of new things. And Fen is asking it of his shoes. And the question is, is this perfect? Like we, you know, we ask that so often, is this perfect? And if it's not perfect, then we dismiss it. And it's, then it's no good. Right? And the problem with that question is that the answer is the same every single time. The answer is no, it's not perfect. It's never perfect. Nothing's perfect. So when Fen puts his new shoes on and they don't feel exactly like his old shoes, well, it's not perfect. And he's upset because what he wants is perfection. And you know, we, we do that. We do that at work. Something changes at our company or job. And it is, uh, you know, we're going to try this new thing. You know, all right, we're all going to implement this new system. And then we find things to hate about it. This is not perfect. I hate. So that's not useful. Here's the better question. The better question is, is my new problem better than my old problem? Mm, great question. Great question. Because that allows for problems. That allows you to track progress through problems. And if we are to just accept that everything is going to have some kind of problem, then we must track success through problems. Yep. I mean, for Fen, right, it's you know, to make it really simple. For Fen, it's 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 quite simple. Like, what's the old problem? The old problem is that this shoe is uh, ratty and smelly and falling apart and you're, you know, you've grown out and you've outgrown it. What's the, the new problem is that it doesn't feel as familiar as the old, as the old shoe. I would say in that case, the new problem is better than the old problem. And therefore that is a reason to wear the new shoe. And you know what? Luckily the new problem resolves itself pretty well because it'll start to feel familiar. And I think about versions of this all the time with the things that I'm facing because we're always dealing with these problems and, and we have to understand some way in which to make sense of them and to feel comfortable engaging with things that aren't perfect. 
Oh, listen, everything coming out of your mouth is like so empowering right now. This is so timely and so perfect. I love this. So I'd be remiss if I had the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine on and, mm-hmm. you know, entrepreneurs listening to the episode and didn't ask you about the changes that you see coming up in the economy. Now, remember, both you and I are optimistic. We see opportunity in yeah. everything. But how would you frame some of the changes you see coming up? Let's call it for 2023. And where do you see opportunity? So number one, I don't believe in future telling because Mm -hmm. I am kind of a history buff. I've spent a lot of time reading and reporting on past predictions of the future. And, uh, you know, they they're they not, never come true. <laughs> they never come true. They, you know what? You know, actually, funny enough, I'm, I'm working on a thing about this right now. So, um, you know, we're about to enter 2023. And I looked back to see what were people predicting in 1923 about the year 2023. And the big debate happening at the time was there was a, a guy who was at the forefront of the development of electricity. And uh, his name was uh, Charles Steinmetz. And he was called the Forger of Thunderbolts, which is a pretty great name. (laughs) That's a great name. Yeah. And he had predicted that by the year 2023, he said this in 1923, he said that by 2023, we will all be working four hour workdays. And we're not doing that. But the work is not as laborious as it used to be. And also people don't work as young as they used to, and they don't work as old as they used to. And so when you average it out, he might've actually been kind of right. But the thing is, most predictions are very, very incorrect. And so I'm not that interested in what people are saying is going to come, but I think it is fair to say that there will be continued turbulence and, and, you know, not every best laid plan is going to um, um, come to pass in 2023. So what do you do? Well, Here's the starting point. The starting point is in recognizing that if disruption has come to you, you are not the only one. Yeah. Right. I remember back in the earliest days of the pandemic, like March, April, 2020, I was getting a lot of readers who were emailing me and they were asking things like, is it still okay to send a cold email? right? Is it still okay to market myself? We didn't know what was going to happen, right? Like people are dying. Is it okay for me to try to keep my business alive? Like what's appropriate here? And I honestly was like, I don't really know the answer to this. And so I decided to just create a little conversation, which we taped for Entrepreneur with a woman who runs a copywriting business and, and had gotten a lot of business off of cold emails and wasn't sure if she should send cold emails. And a friend of mine, really smart guy named Adam Bornstein, who's a consultant, he has a company called Pen Name. And his message to that woman back then was, you know what people need right now? They need solutions. They got problems. They got bigger problems than they'd ever imagined. And the thing that they want most of all is for someone to reach out and say, hey, I understand your problem and I've got a solution. And so maybe the outreach is a little different now than it would have been back then. And But I think that if you can identify what people need and then solve it, you're their best friend. And the same is going to be true in 2023, which is to say change is coming to you, but it's coming to other people too, which means that other people have new problems. They need new solutions. And it is entirely possible that the people and the companies that they used to turn to to solve their problems are not well positioned to do it right now, which means that's an opening for you. Because if you can stand up and say, you know what, I got problems, but so do others. And I'm going to focus on solving their problems. You will solve your own too. Yeah, that's so good. So as the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, you have a very unique perspective on Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs out there and, and, you know, what they're doing to create dynamic new solutions in life for, for people. From your perspective, and you've, I also got to mention you have proximity to like celebrity entrepreneurs. Yeah. So from your perspective, who is a great example or who are a couple great examples of some of the greatest change makers in entrepreneurship today? It's funny. The people who I tend to be most excited about are like Main Street entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because, you know, a lot of the big, big, big names that I could mention are not going to be surprising to you, right? I mean, I could like, you know, I mean, how... If I started talking about Jeff Bezos, everyone's going to fall asleep. And then, you know, and then you've got like really interesting people like like Naveen Jain and yeah. Viome. But, you know, I don't, to me, the stuff that like really always hits me are 
people who have gone through some kind of big challenge and made a decision that fundamentally altered the way in which they do business and relate to other people. Because I find that those decisions distilled down to like a one or two person business are oftentimes the things that make me think the most and that to me like represent real growth and change. So I'll give you like a quick story. There's a woman in Baltimore. Her name is Lena. She has a company called Lena's Wigs. It used to operate as a storefront. So that means, you know, well, whatever, you know what a storefront is. People could walk in off the street and they can shop for wigs. And then the pandemic arrives and Lena cannot, because of lockdowns, welcome people into her store anymore. And she's wondering, what do I do? And then she has a revelation and that is she can move to appointment only. Now, this is not a new idea. And in fact, Lena was very aware of appointment only as a business model before, but she had always thought this is a terrible idea. Why would I ever want to add friction to my customer? Why would I make it harder for somebody to shop with me? And so she had never done it because she runs a storefront and she thought that was the best way to operate her business. But now she is forced to change. And so she does. And once she goes to appointment only, two amazing things happen. Number one, sales and profits rise. Number two, customers are happier. Why? Here's why. Because you know who doesn't buy wigs? The answer is people who walk in off the street. They don't buy wigs. They browse wigs. They're very interested in wigs. They don't buy wigs. Lena had been paying somebody to greet these people who come in off the street and don't buy wigs. Meanwhile, you know who does buy wigs? People who are shopping for very religious or personal reasons and who would love to have a private experience not surrounded by people who are coming in off the street. So because Lena thought there was one way to run her business, she was actually spending money on that staffer to greet people who were not her customer at the expense of people who were her customer. And it wasn't until a massive moment of disruption came along and forced her to discover a new way to do her business that she discovered there was a better way. And now she says, I mean, you know, I stay in touch with Lena. I talked to her at the very beginning of the pandemic. And she tells me that her business is like radically changed as a result. She now works less hours. She makes more money. She uh, has leaned into things that she never thought were important, like virtual presence and even doing virtual fittings. She always thought, no, everything has to be in person. I run a storefront. No, she doesn't. Because you know what? The thing is like to go back to that thing we were talking about at the beginning about having a mission statement that's not tied to the things that you do. You know, Lena probably, if she had articulated it at the time, she would have said, what do I do? I run a storefront where people can buy wigs. But that's not really what she does. You know, what she does is probably, I, you know, I would leave it to her to articulate, but I would guess it's something along the lines of, I help women reclaim their sense of self-esteem and self. Yeah. And that doesn't involve a storefront, right? Like there are a million ways to do that. And once you liberate yourself from those boxed in ideas, of the value that you have for others, you make it possible to infinitely expand the value you have. Jason, this is so good. Like there's so much, there's so many hidden blessings in the change that we are fearing, yeah. right? So once you lean into that, once you take these stories, use them as evidence, the fear goes away, the opportunity opens up and you're going to be in that fourth stage from the book where you cannot imagine ever going back you know, to the way things were before. I know we're getting close on time here. Do you have any other stories or one particular lesson from the book that is just a game changer for everyone listening? We talked a little bit about earlier about maybe not remembering the change that you just went through. It's like, why does Fen forget about his shoes? Let me tell you about how memory works because I called some memory researchers because I was really curious to understand how we were processing our memories and why things that we hated, we would become nostalgic for and what that tells us about the way in which we literally experience change. Because I think that if we understand how we are programmed to react to things, we can counter-program ourselves or at least catch ourselves in those moments. So I, I talked to a couple of memory researchers, including this guy named Philippe de Brigard at Duke University, and they told me some fascinating stuff. So let me tell you. Number one, here's how memories work. 
right now, Chris, you and I are talking with devices that are built to record with perfect accuracy uh, and then replay with perfect accuracy. That is not how our brains are built. And there's a good reason for that. And the reason for that is because our brains are built to move us forward, not to keep us thinking into the past. And so what that results in is a couple of really fascinating experiences. Number one is that when you remember something, when you listen to this podcast, what's going to happen is that your brain is not going to record this podcast the way that a machine would. Instead, what your brain is going to do is to the degree you remember anything at all, it will break up the memory into a million little pieces and basically store them in different parts of your brain. And then when you try to recall something later about this particular memory, your brain will reassemble those little pieces into what is hopefully a coherent whole. Philippe de Brigard of Duke University described it to me like a paleontologist putting together a dinosaur bone that had been shattered into a million pieces. Now, the paleontologists will do that by utilizing the best knowledge available about what that bone was structured like. And so when there are missing pieces, as there inevitably will be, they fill it in with the gaps based on the knowledge of other dinosaur bones. We don't have that. So when we uh, reassemble the little fragments of our memory into a coherent whole, and it's missing little pieces as it will, you know what we fill it back in with? Here's what. Philippe said that our system of memory in our brain is very closely interrelated with our system of imagination. So we are imagining the gaps and then we're experiencing them as memory. Now, let's set that aside for a second. Let me tell you about another thing. It's called fading affect bias. So fading affect bias is a brain phenomenon in which we retain the emotions associated with good memories far longer than we retain the associations with bad memories. Doesn't mean we forget bad memories, and obviously trauma can change the calculation here, but just normal bad memories, we remember them, but we aren't called back to that moment emotionally. This is the reason, for example, why women are willing to have a second child, because they're not conjuring up the emotions associated with whatever that pain was. They remember it, but they can't emotionally access it. And that's true for us in just about everything. So the reason, again, is because our brain is built for moving forward. Because if we felt as sad or scared or angry every single time we recalled a bad thing that happened in our lives, we would have a really hard time moving forward. But we really do want to be able to conjure up good experiences because good moments, good emotions, that helps us move forward. That fuels relationships. That's how we we, we renew our love of each other. That's how we are excited to take on new risks. And so anyway, let's put these things together. Fading affect bias. We forget the emotions associated with bad memories. And then also memory fragmentation. We fill in gaps in our in our memory with imagination. What we are ultimately doing here is that we are forgetting how hard things used to be and then we are imagining in part how good they were. That, that is what's going to drive part of you feeling like whatever came before is so good that it must be clung to and how whatever comes next can't possibly live up to what you already had. It is in part reality, and it is in part something that you are imagining. And if you can recognize that, I understand that that doesn't mean that you can like set it aside, that it liberates you from any kind of nostalgia or feeling like you have to cling to the thing that came before, but it maybe at least will embolden you to move forward knowing that what you're stepping into isn't nearly as treacherous as it might seem. God, that is awesome. Jason, seriously, this this 45 minutes or whatever it's been, I guarantee people have so much more courage now to step into changes, whether it's change that is optional or whether it is change that is forced upon them. This episode alone will get them ready for it. I want to help people with change a little bit. Your new book, it's hot. People are loving it. It's called Build for Tomorrow, an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast and future-proofing your career. It's totally timely to what's going on right now. You don't know I'm going to do this, but no. if you'd be willing to share your Instagram, can people communicate with you on Instagram? Oh, yeah, yeah. I respond okay. to all DMs. So if you'd share your Instagram, if they tag both you and me in one of their powerful takeaways from this episode... The first 25 people to take both of us with their powerful takeaway, I will send them a free book from my team. We'll buy and send them a free book. 
Uh, we love doing this with authors that we love. And this book needs to be in people's hands. So the first 25 of you listening right now, if you tag Jason and myself on Instagram with your biggest takeaway, me and my team will send you a book. Now, Jason, what's your Instagram? Where's the best place to get hold of you? Oh, well, first of all, that is awesome and generous. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. My Instagram is Hey Pfeiffer. So that is Hey, H-E-Y, like, hey, and then Pfeiffer, my last name, F-E-I-F-E-R. That is so good. And if people want to go buy the book themselves, where's the best yes. place to grab it? Anywhere, anywhere. It is available in all formats except for Stone Tablet. Haven't done that one yet. But otherwise, we've got hardcover, ebook, audiobook. You just go to Amazon or wherever you get books and uh, and you'll find Audible, whatever. You'll find it. That's awesome. It's such a good book, you guys. Seriously, grab it. Build for tomorrow. All right, so closing question. I ask everyone this question. Uh, yeah. The tagline to the show to give you some some background knowledge is when good people make good money, they can do great things, right? Mm -hmm. We're very much generosity based. So my question to you is, what is something great that you've been able to do for other people now that you've experienced so much success? Wow, love that question. You know, I think a lot about the role that I occupy because I didn't build it. You know, I mean, I didn't make Entrepreneur Magazine. It's it's not owned by me. And so I'm I'm incredibly aware that the the role that I occupy is one that I'm fortunate to have and that also I'm renting mm -hmm. because somebody was editor in chief before me and somebody will be editor in chief after me. Yeah. And therefore, it's really my job to be a great steward of this role. And that I can also be as accessible and change the experience of this role as I, as I, as I want. It's one of the things that I have full control over. And, and I know that a lot of people want to reach somebody like me and that they have never been able to do something like that before. And that I can offer insights that will help them. I can create opportunity for them. And so I've really made it, I've kind of made it a, a mission of mine to rent this role with as many open doors as possible. I respond to every DM. I try to make myself incredibly accessible. I've really loved, like one of the greatest things to me is is being able to go somewhere, have somebody talk to some random person at some event or something, and then say, hey, you know what? I think you you should talk to this other person who I just met last week and then like make that connection because I, I feel like I'm just, I'm standing in the center of something and I don't know how long I'll be able to stand in it. But while I'm here, I feel like the coolest thing that I can do isn't to just like do a good job at the job, but rather to, while I'm this, be able to reach as many people as possible for whom it would be incredibly meaningful to connect with the person who is standing at this intersection. I, I you know, I don't know. It's just like, it's a thing that I think about a lot. Because, you know, it's like, how, how many times in your life are you, are you like, you know, it, it's sort of like, this is not, I'm not comparing myself to being president. I'm not president. But, you know, like, I bet that when somebody occupies a role like that, they're just aware that, you know, somebody being able to meet them is suddenly a big deal, you know, and um, they come to represent something to somebody else and that they can, just by offering a moment of their time, I remember, didn't, didn't like Obama write, because, you know, the president, every president gets like a bazillion letters. And I think that he would always, every every week, he would set aside time to write back personally to like 10 people. Yep. You know, you can't possibly write back to them all. But it's like those 10 people got a meaningful experience that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. I, I think a lot about being able to do stuff like that. And 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 um, I hope I'm doing a good job. That's cool. That's generosity at its finest. That is really cool that you're doing that, Jason. What a class act. You taking the time to be on here today. What a class act. The information that you have left behind is definitely leaving all of the listeners better than before they listen to this episode. And, and I just can't thank you enough. And I want to remind everybody, number one, just go out and grab the book, build for tomorrow. But number two, for the first 25 of you that tag Jason at Hey Pfeiffer on Instagram and tag myself, with your biggest takeaway, we will send you a free book. Jason, thanks a ton for being on, man. I sure appreciate it. Oh, thank you. This was a blast. I, I you know, it's what a great conversation. And um, and thanks for giving away those books. That's that's really meaningful. Oh, literally our pleasure. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. 
it would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success. 